Hi again, this is Chapter 2, Tax Law and Research. What we'll be doing in this particular module is the tax process, which begins with tax filing and takes you through what happens if there's an audit, if there's a disagreement in a tax audit, etc. The slides are color-coded. Most of the material in this module is black. There is some medium material in this module, and there are some things that I'll be talking about that will have purple font, and they're there in case you need them in real life, but they tend not to be on the test as test questions. The tax process. First, a taxpayer prepares and files a tax return. Now, if the tax return looks normal, and we've got a slide on here in a few that'll tell you what not normal looks like, but if the tax return looks normal and the amount that is due is paid or a refund is due, that refund is will be refunded, the amount paid, they will cash the check, and that's usually the end of the process insofar as the taxpayer can see. There's more processing that goes on that the taxpayer can't see that, as an accountant, you might think has an audit element to it, uh, but the taxpayer is relatively happy if they file the return and they don't hear from the IRS again. In some cases, uh, an audit return does not look normal, and where it does not look normal, um, then sometimes it's pulled for examination. Now the IRS likes to call their audits examination, the rest of us call them IRS audits, so if you're dealing with the IRS, understand that they think they don't audit people, they just give exams. Um, but it, and if you hear audit in the context of other CPAs talking or taxpayers talking, we're all talking about that same thing. Now that DIFF score is a discriminant information function. Discriminant information function. You don't have to know what it stands for, but it basically is a count of the number of red flags that items on the return have pulled. Um, how not normal does something look? If normally people in a particular tax bracket give $2,000 to charity and you gave $2,001, will you be audited? If that's the only thing that looks weird on your return, uh, likely not. So there's a process as to what the government thinks your IRS return should look like to be normal. And every line item on your tax return that doesn't look normal draws a certain number of flags. And if you have either a huge one huge big red flag or a field of smaller red flags, uh, an audit is generally uh, the result. Even if it gets pulled for audit, there are different kinds of audits, and sometimes you get lucky and the agents don't have time to work it, and when that's the case, it may have been pulled for audit, but you never knew about it and it gets thrown back. If it's audited and it turns out that you owe more money, or if you did not pay the right amount of money to begin with, the account goes to collection. There are two functions of collection, the automated collection service, which is basically a set of machines around the country that print out bills and try to get you to pay based on mailings. If something is a little bit more complicated or unusual, or an actual person, a revenue officer may come into play. Uh, if you do not agree with the way the findings of the exam or the way a bill is being collected, you may have certain appeals rights or you may be able to take the United States to court. And we'll talk about courts as well in a, in a different slide. Let's start with who must file a tax return. This comes up again in Chapter 4. It comes up here. Whenever we see the black fonts, assume that there could be a test question on this. I like to test a lot of the black font material. Um, all corporations must file a tax return. They must file their tax return uh, by March 15th if they're on a calendar year. If they're on a fiscal year, for example, if their fiscal year ends June 30th, we would count out to whatever the third month would be, July, August, September, and it would be due on the 15th of uh, September. Any time for a tax filing normally, there are a few weird forms sometimes, but any time there's a normal tax filing and the due date falls on a weekend, then when that due date falls on a weekend, we go to the next business day that's neither a weekend or a holiday. And so if the 15th were to file on a Saturday, fall on a Saturday, for example, we would go out to Monday the 17th of March um, as the deadline. Corporations can file an extension request, the extension request, if it's in good faith, if 
there's no clear sense that the corporation is really trying to pull something, they will automatically be granted an extension to file, not pay their return, but to file their return six months later on September 15th. Estates and trusts must file their tax returns if they have uh, gross income that exceeds their exemption, that exceeds about $600. That number goes up a little bit over time. If oh, after years and years of going up, it's up to $600, you can see where it would go up slowly. And so if if it comes in at 700 in one year, I mean, that's entirely possible. It does go up, but it goes up very slowly um, with inflation. Individuals must file if their gross income, we're going to have to define that term, and we will in Chapter 4, is greater than their standard deduction plus one exemption. Now, let me go back. Standard deduction came up in Chapter 1 under the expediency rules. We're going to give, we're going to give the alternative to standard deductions, itemized deductions, we're going to give deductions for things like giving to charity, paying sales taxes, uh, maybe having some medical expenses, that kind of thing. And we assume everybody has a little something. And rather than have you account for every time that you put the extra pennies in, in the Ronald McDonald House box uh, at McDonald's, where you put, you may, you pay, put your bear change there, for example, after you buy something. Uh, we're not going to make you document all those receipts and so forth. We're going to give everybody a flat number. And if an individual taxpayer believes they have more than that number, then we'll let them take the higher number, but they've got to be prepared to document it. The standard deduction is a flat number for miscellaneous stuff in life that we assume everybody does and were willing to not ask for documentation on. Uh, you can a good rule of thumb is that's right under six thousand dollars for a single individual, and it's about twice that for a couple that's married filing jointly. We will also uh, have an exemption amount. We give everybody a certain amount to live in, a very very small amount to live in, less than four thousand dollars per year to live in to live on. So if your individual gross income, something a term we'll decide, uh, uh, define in Chapter 4, is more than the standard deduction of about 6000 and an exemption of about 4000 you have to file a tax return. That is, we want to see tax returns from everyone who makes about something just under 10000 or more. Now, if you have... If you're not filed as another on another person's return, et cetera, and you're making like six thousand um, dollars, you probably have a zero percent tax rate, and you therefore won't owe taxes, and you may not even be legally obligated to file. But if they took taxes out of your check, and you don't owe those taxes, you may want to file anyway to get a refund. So you have to file, you must file, if you are an individual and your gross income is greater than the standard deduction plus one exemption. You may want to file if you have taxes coming back even though you don't meet that requirement. Individual tax returns are due on April 15th. Again, that gets pushed out if the 15th falls on a weekend. There's also um, an Emancipation Day in Washington, D.C. that comes on around that time. Uh, so it's common to have a filing date of like the 17th. I've even seen it go to the 18th, I think, one time. But the 15th is where we start, and we will take the 15th or the first non-weekend, non-holiday thereafter. You can file an extension, and the extension will extend your time to file, but not pay your taxes due. Um, until October 15th, and if you make a good faith extension request, then those extensions are automatically granted. Audit selection, all in purple. Why? Tends not to be on the test, but when people get audited, they want to know why. And there's some kind of mystery to this process. Well, the formula for determining who gets audited and who doesn't is not published. It's a, it's a big secret, and I don't think any one person has that whole whole, whole piece. Um, but 
we know what the general indicators are. If numbers look funny in relation to one another, if you have more sales returns than you have sales, you know, you, you better be having a big recall year of something. You better be recalling like those Skechers uh, tennis shoes that are supposed to tone your calves and stuff and results in a huge recall. Um, because it's almost impossible to have more sales returns than sales. So if numbers look funny in relation to each other, that's a sign you may be audited. If numbers look funny compared to others in your industry, if your gross profit is way bigger or way smaller than others in your industry, and yes, they know what those industry averages are, um, you may get audited. If your numbers look funny in relation to known facts, you may be audited. I ended up dropping a client one time because um, he kept claiming earned income credit year after year after year. He was in a primarily cash business, and that in itself is not a trigger. He kept claiming earned income credit. That in itself is not a trigger. But he had two new cars and a really nice house. Uh, and I'm like, uh, no, nah. altogether, uh, it sounds to me like you're taking the cash and not declaring it all and putting it on the return. And I just don't want to be part of that. So if numbers look funny in relation to known facts, for example, um, that might draw audit. Numbers don't match against the disclosure forms. One of the things that we do is we make sure that if line three is supposed to be line one minus line two, the the IRS will go back and check your math, and they will send you notice if that doesn't work out. If the W-2 said you made $70,000, and you say your wages are less than $70,000, the IRS will come in and write you uh, a letter for that. You'll get a, you will draw audit on that. Um, so they do a matching and a math formula and select certain people for audit when those two flags are raised. Finally, we get other some people turning other people in. They do have a, a fairly comprehensive um, whistleblower program. I think they use the term whistleblower, not snitch. But uh, the bottom line is, is somebody turns in somebody else. Uh, they, former lovers are particularly good snitches, by the way. And sometimes one of the hotlines that you use to call in and report somebody is actually called the love line because of that. Now the audit process, I'm going to talk about this, not on the test. This is where you get to like fast forward uh, on this part of the lecture if you're taking, if you're listening to this at home and you don't have an interest in it. Or again, go back and play it five times if this happens to land you in hot water and you weren't before, so you did gloss over it before. Um, the audit process, they do this preliminary return where they do the matching and the math and they look for clerical uh, problems or suspicious items. Um, and then they check it against your industry and people of similar income and they check it against any records from the whistleblowers and if there are enough flags raised, if you have enough points on your diff score for example or they have enough evidence to believe there's a problem, it will prompt an examination um, that where you will, the two of you will have to work out what should actually be on your return together. Now there are several types of exams and these are very important in the field. They're not tested a lot on my test, but they're important in the field. So I did want to put them here. They are in purple. Uh, correspondence audits, sometimes shortened to be core audits, and automated under reporters. The correspondence audit is where you never see a real person. The IRS sends you a letter that says, for example, uh, I don't believe the number of charitable contributions you may please send in evidence that you donated as much as you claim to have donated and you would send in receipts. Um, they automated under reporter said I think you made more money than this. Uh, I have three W-2s. You only filed on two. What's going on here? And you have to explain. You may say, hey, I'm a victim of identity theft. That last one's not mine at all. And, and that's valid, um, but you do have an explanation to do, and the explanation is done by mail. Another kind of exam is an automated substitute for return. This is where, where your taxpayer doesn't file anything at all. And so they take the W-2s that says he has income and all their sources of income. They add all that income in. They take out one standard deduction and one exemption. They figure the tax that's remaining. They deduct any taxes withheld on the W-2 and send them a bill for the difference. 
Um, that's an automated substitute for return. Taken together with correspondence audits, they are like, when I first put the slide together, they were 77% of all audits. That's up some, uh, and the number is growing. Um, office audit, this is when you have a little bit of a more complicated issue or you have several issues. Um, a core audit or an automated substitute for churn is generally something you can answer in a large vanilla envelope through the mail. An office audit, plan on bringing a very large briefcase or carrying in essentially one paper box of documentation. And that's where they have several issues and you go down in Corpus Christi case, you go downtown to, to Caracua uh, with your records and you, you sit down with the auditor and you guys go through one by one. Now, if you're a business, you may not be able to fit it all into one box and all your records, if you have a file cabinet, for example, of stuff, the IRS may come out to you and that's called a field audit. Um, field audits pretty have a, uh, have a pretty high agreement rate, which is to say they tend to get it right on the first time. But it's uncomfortable to have the IRS right there in your office day after day, some people find. Um, when dealing with an auditor, be nice to them. First of all, they totally don't expect it. And <laughs> second of all, they're just trying to do their job. They're trying to get you the right amount of tax. I know it feels personal when you're being audited. The nicer you are to them, the better the audit generally goes for you unless you were to be so nice as to make them never want to leave. Uh, uh, and of course you can't bribe them. So there's always this professional distance that, that there has to be keep it, uh, that you have to keep it. There should be a courtesy there all the time, even if it means that you have to excuse yourself from the room and take a deep breath before you come back. Your goal in any audit is not to get money back. Your goal in any audit is a no change letter. And that's because it says you did it right the first time. And here's why that's important. Well, it seems on the surface you would rather get money back than not get money back. If you got money back, you made a mistake. And if you made a mistake against your favor this time, uh, you may be more mistake prone and you may owe them money on the second time around. Um, so we would rather send the message that we did not make a mistake in our tax return then we made a mistake but happened to get lucky and make it against our favor this time. So again, goal is no change letter. At the end of a, an audit, an examination, if you have the opportunity to agree, there's my handshake down here, with your IRS auditor. And if you agree, you sign something called a closing agreement. And it's like, here's what we think the real tax is. I have money coming back, or I owe money, or there's no change. But, but we all agree that this is the right result. And as long as there's no malfeasance, malfeasance is a word that means as long, uh, that you're not bargaining in good faith, that you're up to something. As long as there's people are coming with clean and honest intent, that closing agreement is binding you normally get a, a warning from the IRS agent saying, well, it's not binding till my manager signs off. And that's true. But I've never seen a manager not sign off where people have been of good intent. And in that way, both parties are protected. You can't come back and say, oh, the IRS did it all wrong and they can't come back and charge you more. If there is part of the assessment that you don't agree with. This will go to a, this will normally go to a 30 day notice. You need to know the term 30 day notice. You need to know the term 30 day notice. The 30 day notice says that you have 30 days to either appeal to the appeals office or taking it to another letter, uh, take it to make this to another level or you go to court. Um, I put in purple that you can do an informal protest. Technically that's true. All your protests should always be in writing and you should get a copy of the revenue agent report in real life before preparing a protest so you know exactly what the revenue agent is thinking. Um, you may also get a 90-day notice 
sometimes you get a 90 day notice without a 30 day notice and the 90 day notice says basically if you don't like it sue us uh, you need to respond to those right away on both the 30 day notice or the 90 day notice there's none of this oh if it falls on a weekend then you get an extra couple days thing that's not there at all 30 days means exactly 30 days we don't care what courts are open or what courts are shut 90 days same deal so you're always going to want to come in early like at 70 days on a 90 day notice etc when the IRS sends a 90 day notice and then says and then you file in court Sometimes it's common for them to rescind the 90-day notice so that you can take it to appeals. But if you get that 90-day notice, it's important that you respond well within the 90 days to preserve all your rights. Statute of limitations. Love to test it. There's, there's my test up there. Because of all the things in Chapter 2, my favorite thing to test is statute of limitations. Um, statute of limitations. The statute of limitations on the assessment of tax is three years from the later of the filing or of the return or the due date of the return. So if you file in March, but you're, you have up to April to file, then the statute of limitations would end three years from April, ignoring that you filed earlier. If you filed, were supposed to file in April, but you didn't file till November, the statute of limitations would toll three years after your November filing. So they take the later of the two events, and three years after the later of the two events is when, is the last day that they can assess more tax, usually. So, if you forgot to declare some income, if we go through here and you find, oh my gosh, I should have declared the $50 bill I found on the beach, and three years has passed since that time, there, it's a small amount of money, it's a small amount of tax, and the statute of limitations has told, and since the statute of limitations has told, you don't have to go back and file a amended return for that. Similarly, if you have a refund coming, you have a refund coming. We figure out when you filed your return or when you paid it, and you can only get a refund three years from the filing date, two years from the payment date. We're going to take the longer of these two here, and that's when you can claim the refund. Um, if you made a very large error, uh, we had one person from Survivor not declare the million dollars that he won. And that immediately opens you up to a longer statute of limitation. Now the survivor, Richard Hatch, that said, oh, I didn't know I owed taxes. Oh, I forgot I made, first he said he forgot he made that money. I don't know how you run around naked on an island in front of millions of people eating all kinds of crap that you and I would normally not eat and then get this really huge check and totally forget about it. He was eventually indicted for fraud. Um, but for most things where there's a singular incident and not a pattern of bad intent, if the amount that you forgot to include was large, more than 25%, caused an underpayment of more than 25%, there's a six-year um, statute of limitations from the later of the filing date or the due date. Now I know I'm going through these fast, but I also know that this is on tape, it's digital, and you can back it up and go over it again and as often as you need to to get what we're saying here. This is also in your textbook. There's no statute of limitations for fraud at all. They can go back to when you were in the cradle and you were a baby. And if you, as an E-Trade baby, were not only so exceptional that you made all kinds of money, but so sneaky that you cheated on your taxes, they really can go that far back under the law. Um, once the tax is assessed, the IRS has 10 years to collect that tax. Um, these are the general rules of thumb. In some cases, the statute of limitation can go longer. There are some processes where you where 
for example, if you appeal something or you say, please give me more time, and they do, then you can't say, aha, you ran out of time. So there are some times when you will be asked to do waivers uh, and, and that extend your statute, and there will be some times, like if you're leaving the country with a suitcase full of cash, they'll accelerate statutes and so forth. If you are unhappy with the, your exam result, also if you're unhappy with the way your account is being collected, you can try appealing a case. You can appeal a case if you have new information that the exam team didn't consider. You can also do a problem resolution um, through the taxpayer advocate. Uh, you can go and we'll talk about that in, in, in a, a little bit of a different way uh, in a bit. The appeals department is a functionally separate department of the IRS. We'll show you kind of a, a chart in Chapter 2 as, as that the appeals is very separate from exam. They don't Internally, they don't always get on well together. Appeals are supposed to be independent. Appeals are supposed to look at it much the way a court would look at your case. Uh, there's a YouTube video if you want to learn more about appeals. I put the appeals mission up here directly taken from the IRM, the Internal Revenue Manual, uh, in case you're interested in that. They handle things where there's a doubt as to what the court would decide. Now, you can enter the judicial system, you can take things to court, but it can be a very expensive process, so we try to av uh, avoid it unless we've exhausted all other remedies. The expense comes because there are often pre-trial motions to dismiss or have summary judgment. Summary judgment is where we say, hey, look, you don't even have to try this. This, this, this case is so clear-cut in my client's favor that we think you should just decide now. Rarely does, does summary judgment work, but it's pretty standard to ask for it. There's something called uh, pretrial stipulations of fact. That's where both sides say, these are the facts. Yes, we agree on the facts, but we don't agree, for example, on how the law might be interpreted. Witnesses cost money. You have to take their depositions. You often have to pay to have them subpoenaed. Um, and you can go to one of four basic courts to begin with. You get to pick which court you go to, but once you pick a court, you can't switch to another court in that same tier. That is, you can pick district court or federal claims court or tax court or bankruptcy court. What you can't do is go through U.S. District Court, then say, no, I should have gone to tax court, and switch over to tax court from there. Um, tax court has a small case division, and that's where $50,000 of less of taxes due. It's very informal. It is the judge duty of, of tax case court. Um, you know, you show up in your Sunday best, but you don't have to have a lawyer to go there. You don't have to pay anybody in advance. You don't have to have tech specialists. There's no jury. And like Judge Judy, there's no appeal. The tax court that doesn't deal with small cases, that deals with the larger cases, uh, is common to have specialists there. But you still do not have to pay the disputed amount in advance and you still do not have a jury. However, you can appeal from the tax court to the appeals court if you don't like the tax court's verdict. Similarly, the IRS can appeal from the tax court to the appeals court if they don't like the verdict. The key advantage, though, is that you don't have to pay in advance. Another key advantage is, again, your, your judges themselves are tax specialists. They live for this stuff. And if you're making a very technical art, uh, argument, like when the law is written in this way, this word could be interpreted either as A or as B. And yes, I interpreted it as B, but since the law was written by Congress and the law itself is not clear on its face, I 
can interpret it either way that I want, because Congress had the way to write it as specifically as they wanted, and they chose to leave this ambiguity in there. So while this may not be a common interpretation, it is an acceptable interpretation. Therefore, I should win my case. Now, that's a very technical tax art, uh, argument, and it would put a lot of people to sleep, except in tax court, they actually live for this stuff. And when you have a very technical argument like that, Tax court is often the way to go. Now, tax court has a high taxpayer losing rate, but a lot of that is because that's where all the nuts file. That's where all the tax protesters file. And they do that because they don't have to pay the disputed amount in advance. So they're just in there trying to muck up the system. And they're summarily, they oftentimes don't show up for court and they're summarily dismissed, but that counts as the taxpayer lose rate. When you take that segment of the population out and look at the taxpayer win-loss rate, tax court has a, a, a very respectable uh, win rate for taxpayers. Next court, federal claims court. Federal claims court hears all cases. You must pay the disputed amount first and sue for a refund. You can't have a jury, but either side may appeal the decision. Claims court Here's all kinds of cases like, oh, they overcharged me when I went into Federal Beach. That may well be true, but that's very different than a tax issue. So uh, Federal Claims Court, you're not going to get the same tax specialty that you would get in tax court. Um, but if it's a fairly simple case or you have a non-technical argument, Federal Claims Court may be where you want to be. District Court also hears all kinds of cases. They hear kidnapping cases. Tax cases bore them. But you can get a jury trial if you want them. And you have to pay the amount in dispute first and sue for a refund. But you may appeal if you don't like the decision. So fundamentally, we see a lot of things going either to tax court if the argument is technical and based on real tax interpretation and a lot of things going to district court if I want to put before a jury the argument oh, the IRS is so not fair. Uh, if it's, oh, you wouldn't believe how mean the IRS can be. If that's the basis of your argument, you probably want to be in district court in front of a jury. Because there will be some people in the jury saying, yes, yes, the IRS is mean. Um, finally, there's bankruptcy court. Bankruptcy court is only available to you if you seek bankruptcy protection and you may not want to go that route but you don't have to pay in advance indeed we don't believe you have the money to pay in advance okay sample test question we're going to read the question pause this take a moment find your answer and come back for discussion which is not a possible venue sequence for tax litigation pause this come up with your answer and then come back Tax court appeals to the U.S. Court of Appeals. A is correct. District court appeals to the U.S. Court of Appeals. B is correct. Federal Claims Court appeals to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. C is correct. But you can't go from tax court to district court or vice versa or to claims court or vice versa. D is incorrect. There are 11 circuits of appeal in Texas. We are in the 11th circuit, which uh, is only three states, uh, Texas being the largest of the two. Uh, we get a lot of, although Louisiana hears a lot of cases. There's also the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. That's as much as you need to know about appeals court at this time. And from there, you could go to Supreme Court. Once we know how much is due, then it has to be collected we're seeing a lot of liens and levies and seizures increasing. We're seeing a lot of people promising you that you can get out for pennies on the dollar, and that tends not to be true. I put a link up there, a blue tax link. And that blue tax link um, is, is typical of these types of, of, of promises. Um, how can we get you out of taxes? We can get you out of paying taxes by partial payment installment agreements. 
Now, a partial payment installment agreement says, in essence, there's no way I can pay all of it within the 10-year time period. And so the IRS comes back and says, what's the most you can pay within the 10-year time period? And once you figure out that what that is and agree on it, the IRS will oftentimes take a partial payment installment agreement. Excuse me. Offers and compromise, which you get by filing Form 656, is generally for amounts less than $50,000. There's a fee for filing one of these. While it's under consideration, there's a moratorium on your statute of limitations. That is, if it takes them four months to consider your offer, it will extend the statute of limitations by four months. And this is another one where they say, how much can you pay? And they look at your assets and your income. And if the total amount over the statute of collections period is less than the amount that you owe, the total amount you pay is less than the amount you owe, they will settle for less using an offer and compromise. Normally, the easiest way, the easiest way to pay a debt if you can't afford to pay it all at once is with the Form 9465. The Form 9465 says what is your name and address and how much do you owe, and you, you spell that all out. Are you paying any now? Pay a little something just to show good faith. And then they say, how much can you pay per month? And what you want to do is come up with a monthly payment. And as long as you make that monthly payment, and that monthly payment is at least as much as the minimum they want to accept from you, then they will rubber stamp and accept an easy payment plan using the Form 9465. First note, IRS hates it when I call it the easy payment plan, but this is a free speech country, and this is as easy as a payment plan gets. Second point, you need to know what an acceptable amount is. If you take the amount that's due and multiply it by 1.13, 1 is the principal, 13% is the interest, and they, as a rule of thumb, they use simple interest. They'll, they will actually bill you for compound interest, but they're using simple interest as a rule of thumb and you divide that by 60 months, and the amount you owe is not more than $25,000. Take the amount you owe, multiply by 1.3, divide by 60, round up to the nearest dollar. If what you're offering is at least that, then they will accept it. They say, make your payment as large as possible to avoid interest and penalties. I sort of agree with them, but not totally. Here's why. You do want to pay this off as fast as you can pay it off, but you don't want to promise to pay it off at the most you think you can pay it off because your transmission will go out or your AC will go out or there will be a week where you're furloughed and have to miss work. Something will come up and then you're breaking your installment agreement and then you have a real mess. So if you promise the least amount that you can and you pay the most amount that you can, to me, that is financially wiser than promising to pay the most amount that you can. One more thing that's not on this slide, but that I do teach in class and it's critical. The most important form you will ever see, the most important form you will ever see or use is form 911. Now, we know if someone's having a heart attack, you dial 911. If there's a fire, you dial 911. If people are coming to take your stuff, if the IRS is coming to take your stuff, file Form 911. And Form 911 can stop the IRS in mid-seizure and get you more time as long as you're not perceived to be like a flight risk or uh, um, taking extreme undue advantage of the system. So you always want to try to file the Form 911 if you have severe tax trouble, and that is a request for the taxpayer advocate, someone within the IRS whose job it is to look out after you, to have the taxpayer advocate look at your case. That's what I've got for this section. This is one of four sections for uh, chapter two, 
and good luck on the exam.